Good morning to all of you. Welcome to our ninth annual conference on China's economic development and U.S.-China international relations and economic relations. I'm Stephen Smith, the director of IIEP, the Institute for International Economic Policy here at the Elliott School at GW. I uh, would like to welcome you along with our sponsors, the GW Center for International Business Education, or CYBER, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies at the Elliott School, and the GW Confucius Center. So all of us are very happy to um, welcome you to GW and to this event. IIEP supports high quality research that addresses critical issues surrounding the global economy, primarily in the fields of international trade, international finance, and international economic development and poverty alleviation. Our four signature initiatives at IIEP are global economic governance in the 21st century, ending ultra-poverty, adaptation to climate change in developing countries, and China's economic development and U.S.-China economic relations. And this conference is the annual signature event of our fourth signature initiative. So before beginning, I would like to extend a very, thank, a very special thank you to Mr. Don Stramiello, a GW Elliott School alumnus whose generosity has made today's event possible. And I'd also ask you to join me in thanking two of our GW colleagues, economics professors Maggie Chen and Chao Wei, the conference co-organizers this year. This clearly promises to be one of our very best conferences in this series. So this year's conference, as you'll see from the programs, has three panels addressing top current areas for policy and economic research on China's development, the internet in China's economy, trade migration and wages in China, and China's macroeconomy and urban growth. So our opening panel on the future of trade integration in the Asia Pacific region also addresses U.S. economic relations, U.S.-China economic relations, and could not be more timely and salient given the events of this week. <clears throat> we get to hear from three distinguished speakers among the world's leading authorities on this topic. And so let's launch directly into our first session, moderated by my colleague Steve Saranovic, who will also introduce the panel. So Steve. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I think it is fair to say that um, um, we're, we're living in interesting times, and there's much to discuss and much to think about the future. So it's very my uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be a part of this and to be able to kick off the first session um, titled "The Future of Trade Integration in the Asia Pacific." Um, as Stephen Smith mentioned, our speakers are uh, Jeffrey Schott from the Peterson Institute, uh, Michael Plummer from um, SAIS Johns Hopkins, and um, Jen Dong Ju from Shanghai. High University of Finance and Economics. Um, we're going to, um, ground rules are going to be, we're going to allow them to offer their thoughts and remarks for about a half an hour each. Um, we've got about two hours in this particular session, so we'll have about a half an hour, um, we hope, for questions. Um, please uh, save up your questions and uh, we can have a, a good, uh, exciting discussion about uh, where the future uh, might take us. Uh, we're going to reorder the, um, the lineup a little bit. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Michael Plummer. Um, uh, second speaker will be Jen Dong Ju. And then uh, Jeffrey Schott, as I understand, is rewriting his speech as we speak as, uh, in light of recent events. Uh, and so uh, he'll be uh, finishing up things at the end. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, in, uh, welcome Michael Plummer up to the uh, podium. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking uh, the organizers uh, for the invitation to come and participate at this uh, very important conference, I think, uh, particularly in light of recent events. Uh, and it's well worthwhile coming all the way from Bologna, Italy uh, to uh, be part of it. So uh, first I'd like to say that this uh, presentation is in part uh, research that I've been doing with Peter Petri uh, that began with work with, for, the, for the World Bank on the global economic prospects and was sort of part of a chapter in the January 2016 
uh, global economic prospects, as well in, as uh, some recent work we did with the uh, Peterson Institute. Um, it includes both qualitative and quantitative analysis of the implications of mega-regionalism. But in this presentation, I'd like to uh, divide it into three parts. First, I'd like to begin uh, with the context and in introduce mega-regionalism, and in particular, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I'll over overview the results of the effects of the Trans-Pacific Partnership we have for our model, uh, which was uh, built together with FANSAI uh, starting in uh, 2009. And finally, uh, explore options for shared Chinese-US uh, leadership. Uh, on this point, uh, while options remain, uh, I'm going to argue that they are relatively constrained in light of the recent elections. Some basic takeaways. Uh, Mega-regionalism uh, has emerged as a very uh, important force, or potential force, uh, for global economic integration. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the first of these accords, uh, in the first of the 21st century, addresses many traditional and hitherto neglected impediments to trade uh, and updates rules governing trade, which is really essential. The last time we had a major initiative on rules uh, was with the uh, passage of the beginning implementation of the Uruguay Round in 1995, and the economy is very different than it was back then, so it's very important for that point as well. We find that on the whole, the TPP should be very favorable to developing member countries. Uh, Global welfare gains should be about half a trillion dollars and trade gains of about a trillion. Uh, percent gains are largest for less developed countries and, um, or lesser developed countries. Uh, and there are actually modest negative effects on non-members such as China and Taiwan. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it's, you know, our results uh, stress the importance of capacity building, active government policies to help structural change change uh, take place and uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, and uh, this needs to be done not just in developed countries as we see here in this country, uh, but also in developing countries. Chinese US leadership in the Asia Pacific could prepare the region for a golden age of integration, uh, but I'm going to argue it's unlikely that the political will uh, will be there at least for the next four years. Okay. Uh, given my uh, constraints on time, I just briefly want to say, underscore that trade is good for growth and development. Uh, this, this is what we hear, you know, we've derived easily from the economic literature in general, uh, that trade leads to growth and trade uh, induced growth leads to improved employment, uh, particularly relevant to developing countries uh, with underemployment or unemployment problems, or of course informal, uh, in inf large informer sector. Uh, trade has important productivity spillovers via imports and exports and their links to foreign direct investment. Trade reduces poverty, uh, but of course it depends on the context. I think that uh, as this paper that many of you know, a survey paper in the Journal of Economic Literature with Alan Winters and, and colleagues uh, shows that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that trade reduces poverty and no evidence in general that trade increases poverty, but it really does depend on the institutional context. Uh, because in some uh, situations, you actually could affect poverty if, for example, you have really rigid labor par par uh, policies, such in the case of India. Production networks driving trade in Asia have great potential to plug uh, least, uh, less uh, low-income countries into regional and global markets, help small and medium-sized enterprises, and uh, reduce poverty as well. This is an important part of the ASEAN economic community, for example, a major pillar uh, of the Asian economic community is uh, an equitable economic region and using production networks as a means of bringing in least developed countries into these production networks is stipulated as an important strategy in trying to close development gaps. Macroeconomic environments and other policies that create greater stability and improve the lot of the poor need to be prioritized, so again the context is important, uh, and active government policies need to be there to facilitate adjustment. And yet, trade uh, does not always have a very positive connotation attached to it. I think we've seen a very ugly uh, year where uh, not only did we see, say, usually a Democratic candidate that would be anti-trade, the Republican candidate pro-trade, this year we saw both candidates trying to be, that were apparently anti-trade, or at least anti-trade liberalization, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a major uh, 
aspect or a major focal point of the criticism to say, okay, we've got this tra trans pacific partnership, it's part of this, uh, of this trade regime. Uh, this here, we see some protests in Maui, uh, by uh, Maui's in, the, uh, in New Zealand against the, the TPP, all right. So, it's obviously complicated. Okay, um, but backing up a bit, why do we have these uh, mega regionals? Uh, arguably and very briefly, in a way, uh, the Doha development agenda of the WTO, which was launched in November 2001, uh, has met with a great deal of problems in liberalizing in ways that are relevant for the 21st century. Uh, this is very difficult because in the context of a very diverse organization of 164 countries, uh, it is, is proven to be very difficult to come up to a conclusion. And so really we're at a point, an impasse at the, at the WTO, and these mega regional arrangements, or these regional arrangements anyway, are one way of pushing forward uh, with you know, groups of countries to try to, to bring down barriers to trade. Uh, also, another reason for regional uh, approaches rather than bilateral appro approaches, which have really dominated the 21st century, uh, is that they're able, to, uh, uh, they're able to circumvent these problems associated with uh, the Asian noodle bowl, or what's often called in the uh, literature the spaghetti bowl effect. I don't call it spaghetti bowl because I really just like it when Italian words are used to connotate negative things. Uh, so uh, let's call it the Asian noodle bowl. Uh, but these, me these mega regional arrangements can uh, allow us to go to rectify those problems, and that is a major negative. Uh, particularly with respect to rules of origin of the bilateral arrangements. Okay, um, often we would argue traditional uh, RTA concerns are exaggerated. Empirical evidence suggests trade creation is is in, usually uh, much larger than trade diversion. Of course, it depends on the accord, but that is certainly true of uh, developed countries' uh, integration efforts. Uh, and despite the RTA trend, we've seen global trade and FDI have expanded uh, over time. It's slowed down of late, but this has been an um, important phenomenon over the last 15 years, and it's been quite positive. It's also true that RTAs that are effective typically grow over time. Uh, competitive liberalization can drive these R RTAs to improve upon themselves. Uh, and, I mean, classic case would be the Canada-US agreement, uh, which morphed into NAFTA, which was a better agreement. Uh, of course, now it looks like NAFTA may go back to the U.S.-Canada agreement, but that's another story. That's a political shock, if you will. Um, the diversion costs of regional trading arrangements uh, can stimulate uh, MFN liberalization, most favored nation liberalization. I think the classic example of that is when the ASEAN free trade area was originally negotiated. Uh, the idea was that you know, you'd, you'd have liberalization across the, uh, at the time, uh, six ASEAN countries. Uh, but then there was a proposal shortly after that to multilateralize all of those tariff cuts. So in other words, as they cut tariffs on intra-regional trade, they would extend it to everyone. And actually, that was uh, going very well. It had a lot of support within the region. Uh, and then the Asian crisis hit and everybody forgot about it. But that's an example of why countries uh, would have a tendency to want to multilateralize instead of having to pay the cost of trade diversion uh, which one gets in a free trade area, right? So we, we can have that uh, effect as well. Okay, um, we define um, mega regional arrangements to be regional arrangements that have a systemic global impact. So we wouldn't define ASEAN, for example, to be a mega regional arrangement because it's regional but doesn't have a systemic global impact. Uh, on the other hand, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership between ASEAN and the six countries with which it has a free trade area, uh, by rule, uh, which would be you know Northeast Asian countries, China, Singapore, uh, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and India, and the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, which is is supposed to be launched as we'll talk about in uh, 2020, um, which would include all APEC countries and maybe more. Uh, depends because it's not an APEC initiative. APEC is not a negotiating forum. Okay. Also, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, is a mega regional arrangement, but it's all developed countries, so I'll skip that. And besides, it has been shelved, and we'll not, we won't be talking about that one for a long time, I think. Now, just to give you some, a view of, of some of the trade patterns, here are the 
are these regional arrangements and the percent of intra-regional trade as a percentage of total trade. Uh, as you see, the FTAP and the EU are very high uh, in, the, in terms of, of shares. Uh, but you know, if you look at the con uh, country like, uh, grouping like ASEAN, it's only about 25%. And while that's up about 50% uh, over the last 20 years, it's still relatively low. However, one would never expect it to be that high if, because they're small economies. If you normalize it, if you, use, you normalize it by their share in global trade, uh, actually you would expect ASEAN countries to trade uh, uh, four times as much as uh, if they were randomly distributed countries. So actually that's pretty big, but typically you'll see small um, trade shares of in, with the, across develop, developing country accords. Trade shares and GDP have been rising rapidly, and it's uh, very, those, that data is correct. If you look at that black line up there, that is ASEAN. Uh, on average, about 100% of tr trade to GDP is about 100%. And of course, that represents the double accounting included in regional production networks, but still, it shows a tremendous amount of uh, exposure, if you will, to the international marketplace, uh, much higher than uh, its developing region counterparts. You see in... Uh, in Latin America, slightly an uptick, uh, South Asia an uptick, but uh, still relatively low in South Africa and, and Sub-Saharan Africa relatively flat. This is what the uh, mega regionals look like in terms of the distribution of countries. Uh, you see the 12 uh, TPP countries there, uh, the APEC countries and the RCEP countries. And I do want to mention uh, that there have been, if the TPP were to go through, uh, there are several countries and economies that have expressed interest uh, in perhaps joining once that happens. Indonesia, Korea has already been in nego pre preliminary negotiations. Uh, the Philippines, even though that expression was made before the current uh, regime uh, was elected. I'm not sure it would be in the short run. Uh, Thailand. Uh, and uh, Taiwan would be also an economy that has expressed a strong interest in joining uh, over time. And we'll talk about China in a bit, but um, this is what it uh, kind of looks like. All right. Now, if we look, we did a survey for this study. We did a survey of how past FTAs have affected trade. And uh, this, is, this is the results of it. These are sort of survey of surveys. Uh, and what you see generally here, uh, surveying these usually econometric techniques that are used in a very large number of models, that these FTAs tend to be, you know, have varied in how much they've affected trade, and it seems to be between about 43% and 255% of total trade. In other words, these agreements have had major effect on trade. And that is very important, and that has been a modeling challenge over time. Uh, some of you may have seen the uh, International Trade Commission study of uh, the TPP, which is a very interesting read, et cetera, but it uses a very traditional CGE model, and the effect on U.S. trade uh, is positive, effect on incomes is positive, but they're small. The trade effect is less than 2%. Now, TPP is a deep, extended accord, and, you know, if you see these numbers about the survey, there's something wrong with that. With our study, it's probably even too small as well. We, we find 9.1% increase in trade of the United States um, over and to, through 2030. Okay. Now, I'll talk about the TPP very briefly. Uh, you know, 75% of the non-zero tariffs go to zero immediately and 99% eventually. Uh, there are certain exceptions, for example, the automobile industry in the United States. Uh, the rules of origin allow for accumulation, so it's much more flexible than other uh, U.S. FTAs. Services and investment commitments are done on a negative uh, list basis, as opposed, for example, in the General Agreement Trade and Services, which is a positive list. Uh, mechanisms to, uh, there are mechanisms to minimize the trade impact of cytosanitary measures and and technical barriers to trade, which are legitimate uh, instruments of uh, national governments, but try ways to make sure that they aren't distortionary. Uh, government rule, procurement rules for, for this new government procurement rules for the seven members uh, of TPP that are not yet party to the, the, G, the global procurement agreement of the WTO. New rules on the digital economy, uh, intellectual property protection, uh, Example, the a major con controversial area was data exclusivity for biologics. Uh, in that negotiation, the U.S. asked for 12 years. Australia wanted five years. Countries like Peru had zero years. And in the end, the compromise was for five years. But if you look at the debates over the past year, 
uh, particularly on the Republican side, uh, about the problems with the TPP, they zoned in on that. They still want the 12 years. But as the agreement as it stands, uh, it is five years. So this was a big U.S. Uh, compromise. And there are new chapters on things like trade facilitation, a cutting edge chapter on state owned enterprises, as well as on uh, regulatory coherence. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning these, by the way, is the majority, from the services aspect on down, most of these things are not going to be uniquely applied to TPP countries. They'll be applied to all countries. Trade facilitation benefits, for example, are not just going to be, if you have improved customs, it's not just for TPP countries, it's for everybody. For services, they tend to be behind the border. That is often uh, something that would be for all countries, not just TPP. Um, regulatory coherence, the same, IP protection. And so this, in, uh, in the case of the European single market, uh, this was noted, and so uh, estimates, uh, modeling estimates of the effects of the single market program usually allowed for a 20 to 60 percent spillover. In other words, when NTB, non-tariff barriers were liberalized, it wasn't just for the European countries, it was for everybody, right? And that was 20 to 60 percent based on some empirical estimates and surveys that they were doing. So in our study, what we do is we use the conservative 20 percent. So we do have a, a spillover effect, but we try to keep it low. But it obviously is important, particularly with a uh, an agreement like the TPP. Now, the model itself is a, you know, it uses uh, GTAP9 data, it, for those of you that are modelers, 29 regions, 19 sectors. Uh, what, you, what sort of makes it a bit unique and different from the ITC study, for example, is uh, we use heterogeneous productivity in firms, uh, which allows for some productivity change when you have uh, uh, economic integration. Some of you are familiar with Melitz's work. We're using that sort of assumption. This was parent, pioneered by our colleague Fan Sai. Um, and we, you know, looking at the TPP agreement generally, uh, we, uh, first of all, we use extensive tariff, NTB, and trade agreement detail as much as possible, uh, incorporating it into the model uh, using the Using the literature, one thing that's novel in this model, too, is we actually endogenize uh, the cost of rules of origin as a cost as leading to a, if you will, a wedge in productivity. And so when you're able to accumulate uh, with the regional arrangement, you reduce that cost. So we're actually able to get some productivity effect by uh, allowing for cumulative, cumulative rules of origin. Um, as I mentioned, 20% of the non-tariff barriers are non-preferential, and we have a side model for FDI effects. Just briefly to give you an idea what this looks like, uh, if you, these, this is trade and goods, or tariffs fall significantly by the TPP. You see in particular uh, apparel, by the end of this, even apparel tariffs are extremely low. Uh, Non-tariff barriers fall, they're obviously much higher uh, in certain sectors, uh, but there's a great deal of uh, progress in, in these areas as well from the, the TPP. Services barriers come down uh, substantially, even though they remain. And by the way, in our modeling, we never assume that you could possibly remove all of these NTBs. Uh, we usually ex assume that up to two thirds would be actionable because some of them were just are beyond the reach of trade. They don't have anything to do with trade. We're not going to be able to do it, or they are legitimate uh, restrictions and things. So you don't. We don't have a great deal of uh, as much reduction in services barriers, but we do see uh, progress uh, the way we're modeling it. Now, in terms of the results, uh, what we see is, uh, the, in absolute terms, uh, the United States is the biggest winner. Uh, it, it gains about $131 billion in, um, in income by 2013. Uh, and uh, that is about 0.5% uh, you know, of GDP. Some people have said that's small. Uh, we argue that it's actually quite large. If you think, for example, that uh, estimates of the income generated by investments during the year, like 2.9 billion a trillion in investments in the United States uh, in 2014, led to an increase in income that's only twice that. Okay, those are either academics. Think of this as being an endowment with a payout of 131 billion a year. You know, when I go out looking for scholarships for students, I, I, if I want a $40,000 scholarship, I got to find a million dollars. Okay, but that's something that pays out over time. So it's really not that small. Japan is the uh, second largest, and by the way, this breaks it down by uh, what the gains, the gains uh, by the liberalization uh, aspects of it. So FDI, services NDPs, good NTBs, and tariffs. And you'll notice that tariffs are insignificant in the vast majority of countries, uh, with the exception of uh, Japan, uh, agriculture, and to some degree, uh, Vietnam. 
Uh, but most of this is due to services and goods and TBs. If we look at it as a percent of GDP, it gets flipped a bit. The biggest winners are Vietnam and Malaysia. Vietnam by far, 8.1% of GDP, very major winner. Uh, Malaysia, 78 uh, and so on down the line. And then, of course, the U.S. is at the end because its, its economy is so large. Okay. In terms of non-members, uh, Europe actually gains. And the reason why Europe gains, uh, it's because mainly because of those spillover effects that we have. Because if you're spilling this over, you, the, Europe doesn't have face that much competition in the goods sector, but in the services sector, there is a lot of competition. And here we're seeing liberalization in services, so particularly to the U.S. market. So Europe gains a great deal in the U.S. market from this. Um, the biggest loser is China, uh, and that's mostly due to good reduction of goods, uh, NTBs, etc. But I do want to mention that some of this isn't standard trade diversion. In other words, uh, a negative effect on China because other countries get preferential treatment over China. To some degree, and this is very important in these mega regionals since they are bringing together a lot of free trade areas, a lot of it is simply getting rid of China's previous preferential access. So for example, there's a free trade area in effect between China and Malaysia at the expense of the United States, right? So perhaps China is, is outcompeting the US in the Malaysian market, not because it's a better, uh, more competitive, but rather because it's got duty-free access to Malaysia. That's classic trade diversion. When Malaysia joins in the TPP, that gets reversed. Right? China is negatively affected, but from an economic point of view, a global economic point of view, it's actually positive. So if you will, preference erosion is exactly the opposite of trade diversion. Trade, trade diversion is in terms of trade loss. Preference erosion is in terms of trade gain for Malaysia in that context. Okay. And this as a percentage of GDP, of course, it's very, very low for, uh, for just about everybody. So uh, it is not very discriminatory. Uh, I do want to mention, if you look at, these are the winners and losers in the U.S. Uh, and in, in the United States, uh, various um, sectors. You'll see that the biggest hit, uh, sectors hit would be machinery, textiles, uh, in terms of employment, machinery, textiles, uh, and metals. Uh, and the biggest gainers would be private services, trade, transport, construction. So the U.S. gains a great deal in, in uh in terms of, uh, in services. But I do want to point out that despite, uh, uh, some, um, well, despite the Trump campaigns uh, mentioning that Detroit would get really hit badly by this and, uh, you know, there'd be a big drop in employment and trade and everything, uh, it's actually not true. It's not true because essentially the U.S. was able to negotiate not liberalizing tariffs for most tariffs in, auto, in that sector for 30 years, okay? So actually in our study we show that motor vehicles has a positive effect on employment, not a negative effect because of that reality, okay? Also, just very briefly, if you look at winners and losers from the point of view of factors of production, because that's a big point of, part of the debate, isn't it? That uh, you know, trade somehow exacerbates inequality, and that's not what we find. Uh, you know, we find that, for example, in the United States, uh, the biggest winner, winners would be skilled labor, uh, but unskilled labor gains as much as capital. And if you include, as um, uh, Robert Lawrence does in a PIIE publication, et cetera, what, what the poor are buying, so if you look at products, since the, the poor tend to buy, you get gain from cheaper products, so those in the lower quintile gain a lot more than the upper quintile, actually, uh, they, you know, uh, Lawrence and Moran uh, estimate that, that actually TPP will be marginally good for income distribution in the United States. And that's true for a lot of countries. It's that labor gains more than capital with the TPP. Okay, so the bottom line is, the welfare gains are significant, with trade gains all the way up to one trillion, welfare gains of 0.5 trillion. Uh, the percentage gains are largest for the less developed countries, so it's good for development gaps. Uh, and there are a lot of negative effects on non-members. Uh, and uh, we argue, uh, in this paper anyway, that to maximize the development impact, there needs to be an emphasis on capacity building for member countries. Uh, the rules of origin have to be liberalized. Uh, they still can be uh, very restrictive in certain cases, say textiles with the yarn, for, yarn forward rule. Uh, automobiles as well, even though it's much better than the case of NAFTA. NAFTA had even rules of origin of 62.5%. TPP, it's between 35 and 45%, uh, but that's still relative, you know, can be somewhat restrictive. So, so more liberal uh, rules of origin. Uh, and better liberalization of developing country products and uh, to expand and, and, and converge on a multilateral uh, framework. 
Okay, so those are the effects. So what are the options for shared Chinese-US leadership? And you know, so what is the potential? Well, the TPP has been cast as a means to compete with or even isolate China. But this has been shown over time to not be the case. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, is part of a process leading to what is supposed to be the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. This was programmed. Yokohama to 2010, the APEC leaders agreed, said, okay, great. We want to have this start negotiations for free trade area of the Asia Pacific in 2020. It's a continuation of what the Bogor goals, but I don't want to talk about that much. So we want to do this, and we have two pathways to do it. We're going to have an Asian pathway and a TPP pathway. Now, the TPP had already started, so it was called the TPP, and the Asian pathway manifests itself uh, ultimately as the RCEP. But these things were pre-programmed, so they're supposed to be going in that direction. Uh, and in Beijing uh, in 2014, a uh, major study was launched on the FTTAAP, really, and it's going to be out uh, next week. Uh, Jeff's on, on the board of <laughs> this. And, and so the idea here is that, yeah, I mean, let's set our stage for that. So, you know, U.S. and China uh, are going to be at the forefront of that, looking forward to the FTAAP. Okay. Um, the United States and China only get big direct gains from mega regionalism when they join each other in the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Uh, we estimate, and something we did in 2014, uh, that each, both China and the U.S., gain more than threefold uh, in the FTAP than they gained in the TPP and the RCEP. So that is very important in terms of aggregate gains. Okay. Uh, the FTAP uh, would have the potential to reform global governance at a time of slow trade and lack of liberalization at the WTO. And just as the diversity of the TPP is, allow, is a strength, because it had to negotiate complicated things like state-owned enterprises and a labor chapter that's very binding, uh, et cetera, um, greater diversity in the FTAP will make it easier to write rules at the global level. So if the US and China can come together in leadership in this form, it could make a very important, not just regional, but global mark. Uh, the stakes would also be uh, very high for Taiwan in being part of this. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, big problem is, is there a political will to arrive at that point? And so that brings us to um, the Trump reality. Uh, and I know that Jeff will talk a bit more uh, about this, but uh, I'll just be very frank. Uh, if President Trump is anything like candidate Trump, he will have major conflicts with China. I, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, his program, which is often labeled populist, uh, has decried loss of manufacturing jobs and has blamed it on China, uh, from currency manipulation uh, to unfair trading practices. In fact, he has stipulated on a number of occasions that the, on day one when he becomes president, he will label China a currency manipulator. Yeah. So whether or not he does that, I'm not sure, but that's what he said he would do. He's even called uh, climate change a hoax uh, contrived by China to hurt U.S. competitiveness. Uh, he's proposed a 45% tariff on Chinese imports, lambasted the TPP, uh, wants to tear up NAFTA, and has threatened to pull out of the WTO. So uh, in short, he is uh, not particularly a pro-trade, He at least President, candidate Trump was not particularly pro-trade, uh, and was certainly uh, anti-China. Uh, success in that, it, despite great opportunities in the next four years, will likely be filled with more conflict than cooperation if uh, President Trump is anything like candidate Trump. Of course, they may be different. Also, Congress uh, is now Republican, and Republicans have tended to be pro-trade in the past. Something could be negotiated in that part. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, Trump is going to become uh, much more pragmatic and everything. There's a lot of uncertainties here uh, going forward. But if you read the cards that have been laid out during the campaign, it, it doesn't look good. Another thing that would bode in favor of changing, changing, however, would be the importance of strategic interests. Uh, and uh, perhaps project will be made. After all, if he understands that if the TPP is, does not go through, it's going to be a major problem for leadership of the United States in Asia, particularly with uh, the new developments in the Philippines. Uh, but you know, I'm not saying that it's smart betting money is on a, a very uh, pro-trade uh, President Trump. In any event, if anybody's interested in, in the details of the model and the results, uh, you can go to our uh, website, uh, www.asiapacifictrade.org, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>